I don't know why. I just am. Hi! <laughs> I said that in front of all of America. Hi, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. Welcome. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, welcome to the Playground Experiment Voices of America Writers Workshop presentations number six. That's numero seis. Uh, I'm David Davila and I'm currently in South Texas on the ancestral land of the Guadalupecan and Karankawa people. Tonight we have artists participating from a range of places all over the country or world. Uh, in some cases, and you can see several of them right now holding up the names of the indigenous peoples whose ancestral lands they currently are on. We at the PEG acknowledge that wherever we are in the country, we are occupying stolen land. And we honor and respect the indigenous peoples that once lived here, as well as the indigenous people who continue to live here and contribute to our society. We at the PGE strive to be an inclusive organization for all theater artists. And with that, I would like to invite everyone who is participating tonight to turn their cameras back on and say hello, hello, and welcome to our virtual stage. Woo, yeehaw. <laughs> Look at all these gorgeous faces, beautiful peoples, the beautiful peoples. And uh, thank you so much, cast, for volunteering your time for these writers. And uh, with that, I would like to go ahead and invite you all to turn your cameras back off and just leave our writers who are presenting tonight. Uh, leave our writers and um, writers. Hi, how are you? How how's life? You can turn your unmute buttons off. David, hi, everybody. Hi. hi. There are there are four writers tonight. Uh, you're only seeing three of them because our fourth writer is actually in an actual real life theater production happening in reality, like in real <laughs> life. And um, we're super excited that theater is starting again and they can't be here. So instead we'll have a statement read by them when it's their turn. Um, and they can watch later on YouTube, like all of you all out there, please use the chat. Tell us uh, how you're doing tonight. Tell us how you're feeling. Tell us what you think of stuff. And welcome to the PGE. This is a little bit about this. This is the Voices of America Writers Workshop. It's an eight week workshop uh, specifically designed for um, marginal people from marginalized communities that are whatever, but we have a lot of fun and we're gonna tell some great stories tonight and share our pages. And uh, we're excited to see brand new pages from new writers. And so let's start, let's go ahead and jump in. And we're gonna jump in with our first writer. Al, Al, please. Al, how are you? How are you doing tonight? Hi. Hi, David. I'm I'm nervous, but I'm so excited for my classmates. I'm really excited for everybody. Yay! Hey. Um, let's welcome your cast and uh, crew to the stage, to the virtual Yay. stage, and tell us a little bit about this piece that you're working on, and uh, without giving it away. Sure. And let's have everyone introduce themselves. Okay, great. So the name of the piece is called "Keep an Eye on Him." It's um. The last days of a paranoid schizophrenic. He was an Italian immigrant and he is reflecting on his life, whether or not it was worth it to immigrate to America. So that's where we're starting. I'm going to have everybody go around. Um, Darpan, make sure you introduce yourself too and oh, break legs. I'm so excited. Thank you, everybody. Yay. Who's up first? <laughs> Do we need to go in alphabetical order? <laughs> Hi, my name is Spencer. I'm playing David and Lorenzo. Hey, I'm Monica. I'm playing Monica Rounds. I'm playing Francis and Mama. Hi, I'm Caitlin Belforti, and I'll be playing Anna and Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Maya, and I'll be reading Kay, Megan, and Woman. And hey, I'm Niall Ridgely. I'll be reading Eduardo. And I'm John Rachapo, and I'm reading for Thomas. Fabulous, y'all. Oh, Darpan, Darpan, where are you, Darpan? <laughs> I'm hidden for State Directions. Um, I'm Darpan Joshi, I'm reading State Directions. I'll be off camera, and if everyone's good to go, here we are with Al Monaco's play, Keep an Eye on Him. Prologue, Eduardo steps onto an empty, frail stage, lucid and reflective to the audience. Even if 
my death, I can hear his voice. Didn't have a nice voice. Wasn't a very nice person. Mama was the opposite. Mama appears on stage. She has their arm around her other son, Lorenzo. Good woman, blind to everything going on, you know. <laughs> I did things with my life, made a family. David and Kay appear. Fixed up cars, played cards on Sundays with the boys. <laughs> Pictures can be projected if projection is available. Fell in love. Anna appears. A moment later, Thomas also appears. Thomas disappears after a beat. And I'm here, and I can't tell you what it was for. What, was I better off? Were my children? Eduardo's family and memories disappear. He's alone again. A Marshmallow World by Dean Martin plays faintly. Maybe I got it all wrong. Shit, it's, it's not saying that need to correct it. I don't know if they can, but... Maybe they could forgive an old, dying, sick man. As much of a bastard as he was, all I can think about is something my father would say. Man deserves a second chance. But keep an eye on him. And I'll tell you, they didn't. Act one, scene one. Buffalo, New York, nursing home, present day. All action takes place in the nursing home. Lights up on David and Kay, here are here for a Christmas dinner, a marshmallow world quietly plays. David is apprehensive, taking small bites. Kay blissfully ignores the tension and eats just fine. Where's Elizabeth? I thought we'd get a quick hello while she's working. She's probably busy. It's Christmas, what's a quick hello? She'll come say hi if she has a minute. Come on, love this song. It doesn't even take a minute. I'm sure we're not her priority. Tell me what happened with her and Maddie again. She's so sweet. My son's an asshole. That's what happened. David. What? He plays on the computer all day. I'm allowed to say he's an asshole. So what are the chances dad's coming? I told you he doesn't want to see us. It's much for family dinner. Mom would want us to be here, Kay. Mom would want us to be happy. He won't even speak to us. Can you remember one Christmas that was happy with him? Yeah. But we're here now. So come on, ho, 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 and all that. Where's Anne? Time and a half. Oh, well, that's good at least. Yeah. You know, she mentioned to me that, um, doctor, you, you know the one who took care of dad when he had his stroke? Dr. Edwards? Yeah, does she see him at work? Edmonds, yeah, Edmonds, yeah, she got moved to his floor. He asked about dad, I guess. Hmm, left an impression, did he? She told him, you know, dad's here and that Ma died. And said his father had just passed away. Oh, it must be nice. Wish we could say the same. Okay. How old was he? Dad's age, I think. Actually, he said his father was a doctor at the psych ward. What? We're having a mediocre, awkward, silent dinner. Do you want to ruin it? Ruin what? What you just described sounds pretty dismal already. I... What? Asked her. David, don't. I, I just thought maybe he could tell us. What? That our father is a psychopath? I think you, me, and our mother, rest her soul, have a few scars that rang that bell. Got the ruby shoes to prove it. Hmm. I did want to know. What? If Dr. Edmund's father knew dad when he was there. Light shift. Act one, scene two. Eduardo is sitting in his room. Elizabeth is outside the door on the phone. I can't do this right now. I have to go. No, 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 no. Stop. Francis sees her on the phone and is holding a plate with a slice of cake. Sorry, uh, I was just going to check on the Grinch, but my phone is like blowing up. Mr. Marino may not be your favorite, but he deserves respect. I'll check on him. Do your rounds. You should be good to go home. Yeah, home. Elizabeth. Elizabeth gets a call. But just don't get caught with that. I like you. No, no, I, I know. I, I just need to, hello. Hi, yes, thank you for getting back to me. Okay. She exits. 
Francis knocks and enters Eduardo's room. Evening. Brought you some cake? She puts a cake down and opens the curtains. You're missing the party. Your kids would really love to see you. Look at that beautiful snow. One of my favorite sights in the world. Would you like me to take you down to see your kids? Lorenzo, get your butt down here. Eduardo, you're going to be late. Where's your brother? It's snowing. You need to leave for school now. He's crying. He doesn't like it here. Who's crying? You don't like it here? It says no one likes him. I'm sure the holidays aren't easy. Do you want to see your kids? Go get him, Eduardo. You need to go. He's in the bathroom. That's his, his special place. No one is in the bathroom, Mr. Marino. Maybe you just need some rest. I'll tell your kid you're not feeling up to a visit. She helps him into the bed. I'm here to help you, whatever you need. Bon Natale, Mr. Marino. She exits. Eduardo springs out of bed like a little kid. Lorenzo, we have to go. Mama's mad. I'm not going. You don't have a choice unless you want dad to be mad too. Do you? You don't understand. Just go. I'm not going until you come with me. Hmm. You know what I think of when I'm scared? What? Horses. What? Yeah. They're fast, gentle, but strong. And they can fly. Lorenzo Brighton said this because his brother is full of it. Horses can't fly, Eduardo. Oh, yes, you can. You remember when I ran down the hill behind the house? I tripped and fell all the way down to the creek. You were so scared you went back to get Mama, remember? I guess. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I hit my head. You can see my scar. Well, Eduardo reveals his scar but quickly covers it. And blood was spouting everywhere, spewing buckets. And when I got up, there he was. Who? Still as you are now, and I knew. Knew what, Edo? That he'd come to get me. What? Didn't care that I was bleeding. All I saw was him and something happened. Why? You wouldn't believe me. No, I will. I promise. Okay, you really want to know? I walked on the water. Lorenzo starts to choke. Eduardo is blissfully in this memory at the expense of his brother. I walked to him and it, he wasn't scared. He bowed to me. Lorenzo chokes a little more intensely. But then what happened? I respectfully bowed back and, and then I climbed onto his back. It's like I knew he wanted me to. And we flew off the ground. Lorenzo is drowning in an invisible body of water. Over the fields, I, I saw the trees, I saw a roof and the rotting figs up there and the holes where the rain would come in and we flew. I could fly. Lorenzo is dying. <laughs> Horses Boys. don't fly, Eduardo. <laughs> Horses don't fly. How do you know you weren't there? Let's go. Flying horses? Flying horses. Lorenzo disappears. Eduardo hears something in the ceiling, a rumbly metallic sound. Lights shift. Eduardo in a classroom, and then the lesson is terrifying. He runs out to the hallway crying. Thomas cautiously approaches. Hi. Uh, are you okay? Fine. You sure? Uh, miss wanted me to check. Doesn't seem like it. <laughs> I'm nice. I won't tell anyone you're crying like a baby. <laughs> Thomas hands Eduardo some tissue. Thomas. Eduardo. Eddie. Nice to meet you, Eddie. Hey, listen, if class is hard, I can help you. I'm free after school. We could go to the park. You could come to my house. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thomas disappears. Eduardo wants to follow, but he hears a crash off stage. Lights shift. Act one, scene three, nursing home, dining hall. Kay and David are leaving. Kay exits, David lingers. He went back to his room, said he was tired. 
I'm really sorry. I know this isn't easy, especially this time of year. Having dinner is easy. We're Italian. <laughs> He's dinner. It's dinner with my father. That that's complicated. Would you tell my dad? My uncle called the other day. He'd like to see him. Do you think that's a good idea? Easier to make peace when you're alive. Francis Gallagher, please come to the front desk. You have a guest. Ah, and that's my cue. Merry Christmas. David exits. He brushes past Elizabeth. Her phone rings. Francis, Megan, and Elizabeth are arguing. Stop what are you doing? calling. You won't come home, won't answer my tests. What am I supposed to do? I told you I can't do this. No, you, you can't come here. You can visit him literally any other time. You're supposed to understand that you have a busy wife, <clears throat> ex-wife, who doesn't need your permission to go to work. I don't answer to you. My permission? Okay, so I should have just left without seeing you. Please stop this, because it hurts Matt. D d don't you understand? There's a lot you should have done. Do you even want to know where? I know where. I'm not a clueless resident following you around. I know where to find you. Stop saying you're sorry and stop calling me. It hurts Matt. Please. I didn't come here to argue. I just came to- What? To say goodbye. 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 I'll call. I won't answer. Light shift, act one, scene four. Eduardo and Thomas are in a park. My father's a surgeon and my mother's a nurse, so I guess I'm going to be a doctor or something. I think you would be good at that. You're very good at helping people. It's not up to me anyway. What do you mean? Isn't that what you're supposed to do? Become a doctor? That's exactly what I'm supposed to do. But if I had it my way, I'd... Uh... Nah, it doesn't matter, does it? You'd what? No, it's stupid, Eddie. It's not stupid. Come on, what? Sing. Hey, don't don't laugh. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Well, sing for me. No, 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 no. Oh, no, you have no, to do no. it. I'll, I'll, I'll walk right now. Eduardo gets up, but Thomas pulls him back. Thomas stands and begins to sing "Something Stupid" by Frank and Nancy Sinatra. He's bathed in ethereal light. The world fades. When he's done, it all goes back. Well, I told you, it's uh... beautiful. Okay, <laughs> but back to studying. Right, so if you think about it, uh, we are in three dimensions. We have mobility forward, backward, up and down, left to right. You have a really nice voice. Thank you, but what do you think about this theory? You're a really good singer. Theory. They stare at each other for a moment. Eduardo acquiesces. It's not right. That's what I think. Why is that? Because humans are really two-dimensional. We, we can't go up or down because gravity. And we think we're superior, but we all are dots. Dots? Yeah. Specks. Little balls of nothing slipping and colliding into one another and vastness. Have you and I collided? I don't know, Eddie. <laughs> Maybe you should be teaching me. You're the smartest in the class. No, you are too, though. I don't know how to explain it. It's like you have the universe inside you. You should show it to people other than me. Like who? A teacher? Your parents? Your brother? He looks up to you. He needs you. I don't want to be needed. I just want to be sometimes. I get that. You do? Of course. Sometimes we'd like to live how we want, then hide who we are behind... I don't know. I really admire you, Eddie. I really admire you too, Thomas. They kiss. Thomas is shocked, but thrilled and kisses Eduardo again. Lorenzo passes by and sees them. He stops and stares. Lorenzo? Come help me in the house. Uh, uh, coming, Mama. Thomas and Eduardo break apart. Lorenzo runs away. Eduardo gets up to follow his brother, but he's gone. 
Lorenzo! What are you thinking about, Eddie? Nothing. Come on. Tell me something. My brother. He loves you. Lorenzo comes back, smirking at Eduardo. Lorenzo starts to choke. Eduardo is soothed by this. The farm, the sun, the orange trees. We, we would climb. Sounds beautiful. It was. Anna walks in. Lorenzo disappears. Eduardo falls in love with her immediately. Well, here isn't so bad, is it? No, it isn't. Eduardo and Anna lock eyes. He takes her hand and they dance. Thomas gets up, dims the lights, and leaves them alone. Love me always? And always. And always. Eduardo kisses Anna. She begins... She, sorry, <clears throat> Eduardo kisses Anna. Thomas reemerges in a holy light. Anna rides in pain on the ground. Then a woman screams off stage. Eduardo follows the sound off. Anna gets up like nothing happened. Light shift to Anna and Eduardo's home. Kay, come on, are you done? Davy, I told you, put those toys away. An invisible David runs in and she scoops him up. Oh, my sweet boy. Kay, I'm coming to get you. She goes to get her daughter out of the tub. Spotlight on Eduardo and a woman. I can't thank you enough for your help. Okay, it was nothing. My pleasure. How can I repay you? There's no need. I, I was just being friendly. Oh, I can be friendly too. No, really, I was just helping. Oh, me too. I'm just helping. She leads Eduardo to the bed and begins kissing his neck. Anna re-enters, picking up her invisible son while her husband is in bed with another woman. Oh, I know, honey, I miss daddy too. Anna leaves. And then I go and spoil it all by saying something stupid like, I love you. Eduardo and the woman lay in bed. Thomas stands in the doorway. Eduardo sits up and stares back at his friend. Light shift, Lorenzo and Mama are fighting in the kitchen. Where were you? Out. Out where? For a walk. I told you I needed help today. Well, I'm here now. I'm not a ghost. I should tell your father you speak to me that way. I don't understand what I've done to you. I need your help around the house. Your brother is studying. He's not is studying, I can tell you. What is the problem, Lorenzo? I hate my brother. Excuse me? I hate him. I just hate, hate, hate. I, I'd like to ha take my hand. You are evil. What, 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 what kind of a brother? Do you have I a faggot for a son and I'm the evil one? Slap. Mama slaps Lorenzo. Don't you ever see that word in my house. Your son, your precious Edo, is a queer, a fairy, a faggot motherfucker who kisses the Edmonds boy in the park. She goes to slap him again, but he grabs her wrist. He twists and breaks it. He leaves. <sighs> Mama has a heart attack and falls on the floor. <sighs> End of scene. Whoa. Okay, whoa. Cast comes back for vows and, and such. <laughs> Thank you, Cass. I totally forgot to uh, ask if there were any trigger warnings we needed to do. Oh my gosh, I, that was the first thing I found. I was like, oh crap, I forgot. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. That's on me. I reminded myself like three times to talk about. Um, uh, I apologize if anyone was triggered by that. Um, yeah. Me too. I'm sorry. Uh, I need to get in a better habit of doing that. Uh, I apologize. But great work, everyone and the actors. That was uh, riveting. Rama, Rama. So much going on. A lot going on there. Really um, keep working, keep writing, keep investigating. This is like a deep world I feel like you have thought a lot about. And um, uh, there's a lot to unpack and uh, go, you know, discover 
after revealing all of that in just the first 15 minutes, that, wow. Okay, um, we need to move on, but great work. Keep writing, Al, keep working. Thank you, cast. Thank you, uh, cast and crew. Uh, next up, we have Denise. Uh, so let's bring up Denise's cast and let's bring up Jackie to speak for Denise. Hi. Jack, Hi. Jackie, how are you? Doing well, how about yourself? I'm good. You're not Denise. Denise is no. not here, but Denise gave you um, gave you a statement to read. Is that correct? Yes, she did. Okay, what? And Great. It Go reads ahead. like this. Yes, it says, I want to thank the actors for giving their time to read my piece. To my fellow writers from whom I learned, David, for being such an amazing teacher. And I'd like to thank you for taking the time to be here today. My grandfather died of depression when the government decided to take the business he'd grown his entire life. Depression is a serious illness and it needs to be treated as such. If you or a loved one suffer from depression, there is nothing wrong with you. Please ask for help. This is for my abue. Great, awesome. Yeah, content warning on content here uh, with depression and issues. Um, yeah, cheers to Denise, uh, who can be here because she's an actual actor working in an actual live theater show, which is so exciting to think that uh, we're having real theater again. I've got tickets to several shows in July. I'm very excited about. Uh, actors, please introduce yourselves and take it away. Hi, I'm Julia, and I'm going to be doing Renata. Hi, I'm Suleyma Guevara, and I'll be reading the part of Julia. Um, hello, I'm Marco Aponte. I'm reading the part of Eduardo. Hey, I'm Peter Pasco, and I'm reading Francisco. Yay. And I'm Jackie, and I'll be reading Stage Directions. Fabulous. Take it away. What's Yours is His by Denise Estefani Mendoza. Act One, Scene One. Morning Time in Chihuahua. The Kitchen of the Parra Family. A radio next to the kitchen sink plays the morning news. There is a long kitchen table attached to the wall. Around it are the kitchen appliances. In front of the table, there is a round dining table. Julia, a funny, lively woman in her 70s wearing a green dress with white flowers and dress flats cooking breakfast. Eduardo, a serious, sometimes playful man in his early 80s, sits on the table attached to the wall wearing a white undershirt and pants. He's reading a newspaper with glasses on. He eats pistachios from a bag. Radio is playing the Chihuahua State Anthem. You want frijoles con queso or sin queso? Eduardo does not answer and continues reading the newspaper and snacking on pistachios. Julia turns around and laughs at herself. Viejo! Eduardo huh? turns and looks at her. Huh? Estás pero tan sordo! God help you! You want cheese on your beans? Ah, uh, sí, sí, por favor. Eduardo looks over at what she's making with curiosity. She's cooking too much. I'm not gonna eat that much. Well, it's a good thing your eyes work. Tenemos invitados. ¿Tenemos pan mojado? Tu hijo va a venir a desayunar. Ah. I don't know why though, so don't ask me. Mm -hmm. There is a knock on the door. Julia looks over in excitement. Ah, he's here. I think he wants to talk to you about something. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know what about, but you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> Julia starts heading towards the door, then turns around. Well, if you must know, es sobre el, el negocio. Ay, ¿para qué? Ay, ya, no es nada malo, viejo. There is another knock at the door. Julia heads to open the door. Francisco Eduardo, an ambitious and in the moment man in his 30s, enters wearing jeans, black boots, a white shirt, and a brown jacket with a fur collar and a baseball cap. One could call it a trucker's outfit. Hola, mamá. ¿Cómo está? Hola, mijo. Just in time. El queso is almost melted in los frijoles. Pues, la luck del para. 
Hey, pa. Eh, mijo. Francisco and Eduardo do a handshake hug and strongly pat each other on the back. Eduardo sits on the table in front of his dad. So, what did you want to tell me? Mamá, qué chismosa. ¿Por qué? Francisco rolls his eyes and looks away for a second. Chismoso. <clears throat> well, can we eat first? Pásame los platos, pues. Francisco gets up and walks behind Eduardo to grab plates and hands them to his mom. He hums to the song on the radio while he does this. He grabs a cup and pours himself some coffee. The whole time Eduardo watches him. Francisco notices his dad watching. Pues, I know I'm handsome, papá, pero... Mira aquí. Uh, <laughs> pero no me mires tanto que me gastas. <laughs> ah, este chamaco. <laughs> Eduardo gets back to his newspaper and snacks on his pistachios. Francisco grabs one. Radio states, the sovereign state of, of the sovereign state government of Chihuahua in the name of the people for the people have decided to take back the water supplies which were previously sold to independent parties. I always knew water business was bad. ¿Qué de comer, mamá? Eggs with chorizo and frijoles con queso. How many tortillas? Francisco nods towards his father. Eduardo is still reading his newspaper. Eduardo looks at Julia. Tortillas! Ah, tres, por favor. Okay. También, por favor, ama. Julia places the plates in front of each of them and a fourth one. Uh, who else is coming? Renata. Oh! Ya está la comida! Ay, boy! Again? Dejenla. Renata, a direct tunnel vision woman in her mid-30s wearing pajamas, walks into the kitchen with a laptop and sets it down on the round dining table. She plays with her laptop. Actor can improvise between typing or clicking. Mija. Renata uh, looks up. Julia looks down at her plates placed in front of the chair on the table attached to the wall, then at her. I have work to do, mom. Andale pues. Julia picks up the plates and is about to take it to her when Renata notices and gets up to grab it herself. She gives a kiss on the cheek to Julia and then Eduardo. She then starts walking back to her table and smacks Francisco on the back of the head. Orale. Renata gives him a small smile and a nod. Still no husband, huh? Still working for dad, huh? Hey, niños. Anyway, what brought you what brought you here for breakfast, Mijo, on this beautiful morning? I was not expecting you. Everyone recognizes that I don't know anything tone Julia Julia uses and all react accordingly. Papa, I wanted to You want papas? No you say. Next time. Uh, I just wanted to come to see my parents. That's very sweet of you, mijo. We are getting old after all. Yes. Who knows how many days we have left. I feel young, pero lo que sí es que estoy cansada. No me digas. Oh, yes. Especially your papá. Aren't you tired, Eduardo? Eduardo keeps reading the newspaper and eating pistachios. Did not pa. hear them. Pa. Huh? Papa, don't you think it's time you retire? True. Francisco. Ma, it's fine. Papa, it's time. Look at you. What about how I look? You look good. It's just... You're getting old, Papa. Ya descansa. You've done your time. Don't you think it's time to take some time? And who's going to take care of the bosses? Yo, obvio, Papa. The telephone rings. It is attached to the wall in closer proximity to Renata. Everyone is silent. Typing keys, a song about love for the country, and the phone are heard. Eduardo looks at Francisco, then at the phone. 
Julia looks at Renata. Mira. Renata looks up and Julia gestures at her to pick up the phone. Renata sighs, gets up and picks it up. Bueno, what Francisco is saying. Ama, it's for you, it's Paloma. Julia oh. lights up and quickly walks to the phone. Says the following line as she walks over. Espérense tantito. Bueno. Papá, I know the business. I've been working for you since I was 12. I know how to break apart each bus and put it back together. I've learned the financial side. I get along con todos los buceros. Let me help you retire. I'm the Michael to your Vito Corleone. You can trust me, papá. Mijo, yo quiero. No es cierto. Con la señora de la esquina. Dios mío, I hope Jesus wasn't looking. I believe you Santa are... Santa Maria de Cachu. Uh, I believe you know the bosses. Pero la confianza. Ah, that, that was... La confianza es todo, mijo. Uh, I know you're doing better, pero being in charge, eso es estresante. I can handle stress, papá. Eduardo studies him. Papá, I'm clean. Eight years clean. Eduardo sighs. Eduardo reaches for the radio as it states, Governor declared we all must work together now to get back to and turns it off. He's thinking. We just hear Julia's conversation on the background. After a moment, Renata looks up from her computer. De aquí a que te decidas, hasta yo me voy a morir. Hmm? Papa, stop being dramatic. Francisco has been doing really well job for a really long time. He is always working whenever I call him and he is the only one who actually wants to take over the buses. Plus, you can pay him cheap because he's family. Orale. De nada. End of conversation. Renata grabs a pistachio from Eduardo's bag and sits back down on her table and continues working. Eduardo sighs and smiles. Eduardo extends his hand. Francisco smiles in excitement and gets up to shake his dad's hand. Gracias, papá. I'm going to make you proud. <laughs> Primero, te voy a entrenar. Claro. Sale, pues. The three of them smile and continue on with their food. Bueno, pues, ya, ya me voy. Besos, comadre. Sí, nos vemos con, una, con unas copitas. Sale. Bye. Julia walks back to the table and sits. Ay, pero Eduardo, if we were to retire like we should, who could step up and take over los buses? Nobody answers, but everyone reacts to Julia. Eduardo gets up and turns the radio back on, sits back down. Viejo! Así te escuché! Lights fades along with the voice of a man giving a speech over the radio. It is time for change. It will not be easy, but it is for the advancement of the sovereign people in the great state of Chihuahua. Scene two, morning, three months later. Francisco is sitting on a table holding a cup of coffee and fidgeting. Looks at his watch, looks around, sips his coffee. Looks at his watch, checks his phone, sips his coffee, looks around, Renata enters and looks for Francisco. Time is slow. Spots him and walks his way. A ver, ¿qué horas? Well, what's so important that couldn't wait? Francisco pulls out a letter from his jacket pocket. He is nervous. Renata noticed his nervous demeanor. Hey, is this a bad day? Is legal? Renata takes it and opens it. 
Congratulations, your company's about to be a part of the history of our great state of Chihuahua. The state government has decided to organize the public transportation and unify. It is under one single governmental branch. Chihuahua Bus will be the first state in line of all the unified the nations to successfully open the service to all of his residents. Hold on, hold on. Is this what I'm saying, what I think it's saying? Keep reading. Our manager of execution will soon contact you to schedule the bus pickups for the sovereign state of Chihuahua. You will be rewarded for your participation in this great project for the people of the government. Oh my God. Renata studies the letter. Can they do that? Well, all of the territory in Mexico is property of the government. This isn't territory. These are buses. Right. So what the fuck? Esperate, let me think. Uh, have you told dad? Are you crazy? Are you crazy? This is his business. Esperate, esperate. Renata, just think about it. Imagine if our dad finds out that his business, his life's work, as he likes to call it, is being taken away. He's old. Le va a dar un infarto, literal. You have to get dad. You give dad less credit than he's due. Oh, yeah? When's the last time you took him to the doctor? I've been going to school. And when was the last time you took him to the doctor? En serio, why do you think mama was helping him to convince him to let me run the bus los buses? Because you're el hombre de la casa, the favorite. His diabetes is getting really bad. He can't hear. Mi mamá me dijo. Why didn't you tell me? No. Ahorita no, see? He just needs to change his diet. Yeah, eso es todo. So, what do you want to do? Pues, first of all, we need to stop dad from finding out. We can get mom to stop the calls, you know? I mean, mama, you might as well have told dad. She invented the world she's most in. You got a better idea? Have you talked to the other bus drivers, owners? Uh, you know. How long did... Did you get this? Uh, uh, like five days ago. Five? You waited five? Okay. If you, if I were you, I reach out to the other owners. Maybe you can get all together and file a lawsuit. I thought you said que lo hicieron todo legal. Yes, but you can still file a lawsuit. If you do it together, you may get a better chance. Fighting the power. I am the man of the house. Renata smacks him. Their small laugh overpowered by doubt. Blackout. Woo wee -ow. Oh man. That's, that's, oh no, that's sad. We'll see uh, what's gonna happen. Um, Fabulous job, actors, actors, since great job, take a bow. Um, can't see where that, can't wait to see where that goes. If you're listening out there, Denise, keep writing. And since Denise is not here, let's move on. Great, great work, actors. <laughs> so please, well, let me welcome to the stage, Ivory. Boop, 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 doo, 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 doo. Ivory, how are you? Hi, I'm great, how are you? I'm good, thank you for asking. Yeah, to, uh, let's welcome your cast and crew to the stage and as they do, tell us about your piece. Yes, so hi, hi everyone, my name is Ivory Bennett. I am a writer for today's presentation and my piece is called Before We Go Too Far. It is a working title, so it may end up changing. But essentially, this is about a coming of age story of a young black man who is in Pittsburgh. It's centered around his years and his undergraduate degree career. And we see him kind of contemplating his character and how that aligns in every facet of his being. Um, there are some trigger warnings in there. We have issues of violence, mental and emotional instability. Um, and abandonment, so just be mindful of that. Um, and I'm so grateful for this opportunity with the PGE. And thank you, David, and thank you, Mike, and thank you everyone who showed up to support me and be a part of this. And I hope that you all find it a wonderful experience. So I'm excited, is it, a, is it a play or a screenplay? It is a play. 
it's a play. Cool. Good. 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 So, yeah. yeah. Great. So uh, actors, introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Christine. I play Angel. Hi, I'm Brandon. I play Michael. Hello, I'm Courtney, and I'm playing Grandma Uma. Hello, I'm Lauren, and I'm playing Omaji. Is that everyone? Playing? And playing State Directions. <laughs> Great. <laughs> awesome. Before we, go too far, before we go too far by Ivory Bennett, scene seven. Bring Me Joy by Anita Baker plays. You bring me joy when I'm down. Oh, so much joy when I lose my way. Your love comes smiling on me. I saw your face and then I knew we would be friends. I was so afraid, but her eyes, they'd say, come to me. Music fades and light grow on scene. Two kids aged five are playing a hand game known as slide. Michael is losing. Oh, what's that? What? That look. Angel turns to look. Michael runs in the opposite direction. She turns to chase him and catches him. Ted, you're right, Michael. Oh, I'm tired. Okay. The two lie on a thick wooden slatted picnic table and stare at the sky. <laughs> Angel is twiddling a leaf in her fingers. Michael sees a caterpillar, picks it up, places it on his leg. It slowly inches across his knee. Do you know where babies come from? Their parents. <laughs> they hug really tight at nighttime, of course. Then the mommy grows it into her belly for nine weeks. Uh, months? No, silly. Then where do babies come from, smarty pants? Babies come from caterpillars. Caterpillars? No. They do. That's why babies and caterpillars are so squishy. The baby becomes a baby after the caterpillar goes to sleep in its cocoon. You're crazy. No, really. Then the butterfly pops out of his cocoon and finds a stork to eat it. And then the stork transforms into a baby and it carries it to its mom. Whatever. Did I, tell, did I ever tell you about my mom? Michael has been pumping his cheeks full of air to capacity. Then he pops them <laughs> with both hands. Nope. Did she look like you? Mm-hmm. And her hugs feel like a pillow. She likes apple pie like me. And she wears the prettiest lipstick, Fire Engine Red. It stains my cheek every time she kisses me. My daddy will be home soon. He flies planes in the military. And when he gets back, he said he will teach me. Do you think your dad knows my dad? Maybe, I don't know. When is your mom coming home? From her work trip? Yeah, she said that she has to finish helping all the animals. Oh yeah, she's in, um. Uh, a veterinarian? Um, can we ask her to send us a shark tooth? And some penguin feathers and a... Turtle. And, and, and an otter. An otter. Uh-huh. Two. One for you and one for me. And then we can swim together and go on adventures. <laughs> hey, did you know that baby otters float on their mommy's bellies? They both hop off the table and face each other with their hands on their bellies. Did you know that otters hold each other's hands like this? <laughs> he grabs her hands. They spin as fast as they can in a circle, pretending to float by looking in the sky, which is full of fluffy clouds. They close their eyes and laugh loudly. Grandma Uma walks onto the porch. Look at these two. Wait, did you hear that? What's that? I think it's a bunny, look. It is my daily prayer. Uh, but I can't see anything. That children whose laughter falls like flower petals floating in a summery breeze. I do, here, give me your hand. Whose eyes read in sparkles of continuous curiosity. It's furry, I feel it's a baby. Whose hearts beat faithfully like the burning core of the earth's inward trunk. Uh, whose hands crawl and creep fearlessly among the unknown. 
hope she's okay. Whose flesh repairs itself anew in strength that feels soft to the touch. Let's pick it up. Wait, did you hear that? Whose ears make music of mundane mutterings. It sounds funny. Whose feet find footing on the most imperceptible path. I don't want to pick it up anymore. You do it. Whose minds are limitless with imagination unparalleled only by God herself. Oh, shh. Whose hearts have endless capacities to love. We love you, baby bunny. Whose perceptions remain unmuddled by Kalia's judgment. Okay, should we look for the mama? Never know the disjointed existence of unnecessary suffering. Young Sonia has walked onto the porch and is standing next to Grandma Uma. Together, they walk closer to the two to make their presence known. Young Michael and young angels are startled. They giggle and run towards them both with open arms. Leave that poor bunny alone. C -c Come wash your hands and eat supper. I don't want to have to tell you twice. Scene eight. Angel leaves for work when the entire house is asleep. She works the night shift. Come open the door. Amagi is a woman whose silhouette writes under the dimly lit archway of the front porch. Her mother is white and she wears that like a badge of honor. Her father is black. Amagi has never known either parent. Her father's mother raised her. A breeze is the only thing that can be seen or heard. One lamppost slightly flickers and a swarm of gnats waltz to its symphony. Amagi has a spliff hanging between her fingers and her nails are long and bright red. Hurry up. The door quietly creaks open. Michael looks around and snatches her inside. Do not wake this baby. The baby stirs in her pack and play. He grabs Amagi's behind, revealing that she has no panties under her skirt. She licks his lips. She never knew love, only attention, but that was okay. Damn, I just wanted to say- What did I say? Michael places his hand over her mouth. He turns her around. One hand is around her neck. The other forearm rests under her ribcage. She smirks. Michael, I have a new song for you. Amagi takes an ear pod out of her ear and places it into his. They didn't talk much, using words, only music. He would play a song. She would play a song. My cousin just recorded it. What do you think? I think you want to fuck. Tell me how you want it. I'd rather show you. Amagi drops to her knees in a compromising position. He grabs her head. One of her hands caresses his nipple. The other assists her mouth. The door unlocks its angel. She's home early because she had forgotten her packed meal. Michael! Angel drops her keys. She's frozen. She backs away. The baby starts to cry, which snaps her out of it. The other woman remains unbothered. Amagi will leave whenever she's ready. Michael is frozen. The crying baby snaps Angel out of it. Angel grabs the baby and takes her with her. Almost like a beautiful souvenir from a place you know you'll never return to. No words are exchanged, only looks, miles of regret, decades of bitterness to wade through. Rain. A whole lot of rain falls from within him. He falls to his knees, still in silence. The wind outside had stopped. Grandmother Uma lay awake above it all. She knew she had always known. Scene nine, the next morning was dreary. The air smelled like springtime, but after a fire. Angel picks up the phone to call Grandma Uma. Hi, Grandma, how are you? Um. I've been better. How are you? I'm... Do you need anything from the store, Grandma? Can you bring me some holy basil plant and some sweet mint? The ones planted in those little pots and some Florida water. Okay, I'll be there with the baby soon. The caseworker should be there around 11 a.m. for the monthly check-in. Angel hangs up her phone, backs up the baby and heads to the store. She would drop off the baby to Grandma Uma, who would be back on, on the back porch. Every morning, she could be found there, talking to the sky before the sun even began to rise. If her plan worked, she would have to encounter Michael. 
maybe someone one would have cared if I was a boy or a black man. There would have been some white woman who wanted to use me for sex or some black woman who would have given me a home in spite of all my bullshit. Some men would have looked out reliving their youth <laughs> through me, excusing my filthy behaviors through a lens of their own regressions and indiscretions. After all, we all sin and fall short, but some of us are allowed to fall more often than others. The depths of hell for the fucking fun of it without any consequences to the happiness of it all. Angel receives a text message from Michael. It reads, I'm sorry, please answer. A second man states, I love you, please pick up. He calls several times, she ignores him. Another text reads, I love you, bunny. Angel parks the car. Michael is standing in the window of the third floor of the house. I don't want to hear any more I love yous. I don't need any more. You can do it. I'm tired and alone. And you want me to win without exerting my effort? And when I make it, don't show up with a grin on your face and a kiss on my forehead. You don't own any of my wins because you didn't invest in any of the stocks that were my failures and shortcomings. Shortcomings. My uh, circumstances that were, are unfair, that started before me and will end before me because I'll be damned if any of my children of mine are ever, ever feels this way in the world with no one to see her or all that she is and all that she does by herself. So, love. Walking briskly, carrying the baby in its car seat, She's also carrying the baby's bag and the groceries for Grandma Uma. I spent all night praying over this baby, Michael. Your niece, the consolation prize God was so kind enough to bless me with. After Michael said, the timing wasn't right for us to have our own. Three months, Michael. I felt her kick me in from the inside, Michael. I still feel her sometimes. She haunts me. The only person who has ever lived in the wilderness of my womb haunts me in my own body. Angel reaches the back porch. Michael knows not, knows not to attempt to approach her, but remains in the window. Angel places the baby next to Grandma Uma. She takes the grocery inside quickly. Fuck your love. I don't want it. I don't need it. It ain't right, fair, or whole. Your love ain't never done nothing for you. And it ain't done nothing for me. So keep it, keep it where you keep whatever joy you pretend to have. You keep it and forget about it. Forget about me, loving me. It's the morning after, the sun is half risen. The baby is in a bassinet next to grandmother Uma. It's just the two of them. Grandma Uma is shucking sweet corn and green peas, calmly, quietly, reverently. A dog is asleep under the lone rocking chair. We see his breath rise and fall intermittently. There's a large mason glass of water on the other side of Grandma Uma. I ain't never been loved by anyone the way I don't love myself. And that ain't selfish. It's self-full. I want to be, I need to be complete in this world because I'm alone. And I can't only be half of me. I need all of me and all of my soul. You ever wonder why you can't sleep at night? Feel uncomfortable? It's them scars. Them scars you carry on your back. Them scars that drip your ancestors' blood. They get the itching because you got your freedom. You got your freedom, but you ain't even free. They died for you. You ain't even free. Baby fusses, Grandma Uma's hand soothes her. You ever wonder why people don't talk about their pain? I read pain. I see it in people's eyes. I hear it in their voice and the way they laugh when they get nervous or the way they croon when they recall the memory. I see it in the fingers of the barber down the street. His fingers no pain. Ain't no pain in death or flesh. They know pleasure too, but they know more hurt than anything. <clears throat> yeah, I know pain. I may love the pain and freedom too. 
places bad baby back in the bassinet. Black men are so strong and so beautiful. I hate that they can't see. And I hate that they can't see that black women is the only ones who see it. We see it and we love them still. End of scene. Fabulous, fabulous work. Wow, those monologues got me like on the edge of my seat with that, wow. It's very talented actress and actresses and, and very talented words and actors. Wow, that was, that's really strong, um, really strong piece. Wow, so keep writing it, keep working on it um, and keep bringing in pages to the PGE. I, I said this two days ago, I wanna say it again. Today, this is the second night of our presentations of the Voices of America workshop. And um, you all are invited, the writers are invited to continue uh, working on these plays here at the Playground Experiment. You have a home here so long as you show up, uh, if you want it. We're here, Playground Experiment is here to continue developing your plays at our bi-monthly uh, volumes. So yeah, sign up for those volumes when you get the emails asking who has pages and if you wanna read and just sign up and use those as deadlines to force you to get more pages out of you and bring them. And when you're done with a the draft, they'll do a reading at the PGE through the first reads, first draft series, uh, which they're always looking for who has the next draft that's done to um, continue in the de development process. So please, please, all the writers in this workshop uh, continue working on these pieces. We'd love to see where they're gonna go. We feel like we need to know what's gonna happen to all your characters now. And I know Mike like always is desperate to know what happens next. So um, please continue writing these <laughs> and working on them. And so um, thank you. And let's bring up our last writer of the night, Mac. Mac. Hi, how are you? Hi, Max? I'm feeling great. I'm so excited. Yeah, this has been amazing. And let's bring out your cast while you tell us a little bit about the piece yes, that you're yes. uh, working on. Um, sure, yeah. So I had time, so I wrote out a little description so I wouldn't forget Ooh, anything. La la. Um, so uh, <laughs> Everyone Dies at the End is the play you're about to see, a snippet of. Uh, it's about a pair of teenage best friends growing up in the small town of Akraton, Ohio. Not a real place, I hope. Uh, they like to spend their time seeing scary B-movies together at the local movie theater. Uh, I don't want to give too much away. But so far, it's just uh, a weird little play about zombies, uh, magical VHS tapes, um, and I guess the relationship between the stories we see on screen and the stories we tell about our own lives. That's my little spiel. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm so excited <laughs> to see you guys today. Yeah. Actors, uh, can you introduce yourselves, please? <laughs> we totally did that. I love it. Um, hello, <laughs> my name is Dylan Iruegas. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his, or el si hablas espanol. Um, and I'm going to be playing Arrow. Hi, my name's Buck. My pronouns are he, him, or they, them, and I'm reading Finch. Hi, I'm Angelique Carana. My pronouns are she, her, and, and I'm reading for Dana. Hi, uh, my name is Eric Bean. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm playing Mark. And stage directions. Hi, Hi I'm Jackie Siggy. Pronouns she, her, and I'll be your stage directions today. Fabulous. All right. Take it away. <laughs> Everyone Dies at the End, a new play by Mac Raymond. Act one, scene one, lights up. At Rice, Arrow and Finch, two high schoolers, are seated in the audience of a movie theater, peering up at the screen. We see them from the front. The window of a projection booth is visible behind them. A silhouette feeds a spool into a reel. Only a handful of seats are occupied in the rows ahead of them. Everyone is dressed warmly and very 90s Nirvana eclectic grudge with core jackets, cardigans, coats, and scarves draped over their armrests and the back of their seats. The light of the screen washes over their faces like reflections cast by a rippling pool. Arrow and Finch sit quietly for a while, occasionally snipping their drinks. 
the share bag of Twistlers and a bucket of popcorn between them. Finch's gaze alternates between the screen, Arrow's face watching the screen, and Arrow's hand in the bucket. Finch is mindful of not reaching into it at the same time. Arrow bounces his leg. It's obvi obvious that silence is a strain on these two. Their volume rises helplessly throughout each exchange. Arrow flashes a wary look at the projection window, then leans into a whisper. You know he dies at the end. Finch glances at the projection window, then looks at Arrow, leaning closer. Oh. Oh. That guy, Mark, the, the side character guy. What? How do you know? Because uh, the way that he... You cheated again. You read a review or something. No, we, we didn't go get the paper at my house anymore, stupid. An audience member turns in their seat. Shh. Sorry. No, because the way his wife said, I love you earlier, all serious. Finch looks away, fastening his eyes on the screen again. Dana. Yeah, Dana. I thought maybe you were going to say, because he keeps saying he's tired. <sighs> And like, of course he's tired. He's been running from zombies all night. Yeah. He's allowed. Yeah, so it's like, they're telling us he can't hack it, I guess. He's hacking it. He sliced up that one guy with a chainsaw, for Christ's sake. <laughs> like a Halloween ham. You're the Halloween ham. <laughs> You're the Halloween ham. <laughs> like the Easter bunny. <laughs> The audience member turns in their seat again. Now a couple of other patrons glance at them too. Some soft groans and sighs. Shh. Sorry. They're quiet again, but visibly, visibly aching to talk. Finally, Finch gives in and leans closer, speaking in a hushed tone. Who dies at the beginning in a horror movie? Why? As they speak, a pair of hands presses on the, to the glass of the projection booth window in a binocular shape as the projectionist peers into the audience. Then the silhouette disappears. We see light spill briefly into the booth as the rear projection booth door swings open and shut. Cause they get to fuck. Ew. Just saying. That's gross. Sorry. I'm sorry. It's fine. They die worse, though. It's worth it, baby. You think it's worth it? Yeah, tit for tat. <laughs> it is right. <laughs> they try to stifle their, their cackles. The audience member whips around. Now all their patrons stare at them, looking variously agitated. They ad-lib curses and gripes like, come on, and shh. Seriously. All right. I know. Sorry. We're done. <laughs> a theater employee enters and casts a flashlight over the two of them. Hey, you too. The theater employee gives them a small beckoning gesture. They glance at each other, then dejectedly squeeze out of their row and descend the aisle steps. As they move, the theater employee says, Fresh out of chances, guys. Blackout. Lights come up downstage right. Finch and Arrow are seated on a freeway overpass with their legs dangling. It's night. Below, cars hum past. Their headlights illuminate the space under the pair's feet. The light comes in waves. The wind, the wind rustles their hair. They still have the bag of Twizzlers and their drinks from the theater, which they sip intermittently. They pass them back and forth between their hands because of the ice. Fresh out of chances, guys. Oh, who says that? They don't mean it. I mean, anyway, they always say stuff like that. That projectionist is a narc. Yeah, he's weird gets to watch movies all day, but just watches people watching instead? 
we. Yeah. Who watches the Watchmen? Ah, exactly. He's Ozymandias. Uh, probably a perv or something. Probably. I mean, yeah. <laughs> to watch people like that. Yeah. God, imagine getting banned from the Akraton Cinemart. It's like bottom of the barrel stuff. We won't get banned. I hope not. Don't know what else I'll do if I'm bored if I couldn't go watch some dumb slasher. Finch looks at Arrow edging over so slightly closer. If we were banned, I mean, if we were, only we could achieve that kind of disgrace. I guess. Finch awaits for Aro to say more. You still think that guy dies or? Mm, I don't know. Uh, maybe we can ask around tomorrow. I think you're probably right. The wife thing, I think you're probably right. I've been wrong before. Not about important stuff. Is that important stuff? Some side character dying in a slasher at Akerton Cinemart? <laughs> it, I just think it's cool. They're both quiet for a while. Finch edges away. I'm thinking about something. Okay. Finch looks firmly away. Everyone dies at the end anyway. Of everything. What are, what? Like people? No, like characters. What do you, what do you mean? Not really. I mean, I'm just, Thinking how, like, even if we don't see it, we don't see it happen. All characters, you know, they, all characters die. We just don't see all the deaths happen. We just see some deaths happen, but they all die at the end. They're, they're not real. I mean, characters aren't real. I know. You know? Yeah, I know that. Well, you're saying it like they're real. I know they're not real. That's not what. So what? I mean, what, what are you? I don't get what you're saying. I'm saying, I don't know. I'm just in the world, in their world. They're real. That's what I'm saying. They don't, they don't have lives, Finch. Characters don't have lives past, past the end of the movie or whatever. They do, technically. They... No, they don't. That's why we have movies. They're people, though. They're still people. They're not people. They're made up. They can be both. I'm talking about imagining. Imagining their lives? Yes. Imagining their lives. Imagining their lives after. That's what I'm talking about. Why? I mean, I mean why? What's the point? I don't know. The point is imagining them dying? I guess so. That's weird. That they only die if you imagine them dying. I don't wanna like imagine like Indiana Jones getting old and dying. I just wanna see him raid arcs or whatever. Finch is stoic. I mean, what what's wrong with what they give you? Why don't why do you need more than what they give you? I don't. Okay. Uh, okay, well, me, me either. <laughs> I, I, I meant me <laughs> neither. <laughs> me either. It's like a name. It's like a parody kind of British name. Colonel Meathers. Colonel Meathers in the library with the candlestick. We definitely did it. We cracked a case. We nabbed him. Meathers, your candlesticking days are over. Pretty impressive. You know, they had all of Scotland Yard on that one. They had Indiana Jones on that one, too. They had the Watchmen on it, too. That's a stacked investigation team. Go us. Go us. They high five. 
<laughs> what the fuck is Scotland Yard anyway? It's, uh, <laughs> I don't know, actually. Arrow holds the bag of Twizzlers out to Finch. Twizzler? Fade to black as they talk. Scene two, darkness. Then sound, the click of a VHS tape being fed into a VHS player and the low hum of the reel spinning. A disembodied voice. Okay, here it comes. Spotlight up on Mark, downstage right, who is filthy, spattered with dirt and blood. The light he's washed in is greenish, unclean, forebody. He faces the audience with a cordless home phone held to his ear and pants heavily. He's been running for a long time. The following exchange oozes Hollywood cliche. It is full melodrama. Uh, I don't know how much longer we can hold them off, Dana. There are hordes of them out here. Spotlight up on Dana, downstage left, who is also clutching a cordless home phone to her ear. The light she's washed in is warm and clean. Their phones are visibly different, different shapes and colors. Like Mark, she faces the audience, looking stricken. The undead? Uh-huh. Oh, Mark, if you can just make it to the safe house. They've got the cabin surrounded. What about the hunting rifle? Out of bullets. Well, then uh, uh, a shovel, an axe, a, a chainsaw. I took a chainsaw to one already before they ripped it away. You should have seen me, Dana. You wouldn't have recognized the man you married. Mark, there must be something. There are too many of them, Dana. And they're too strong. And I'm so tired. These things aren't like us. They don't have human weaknesses. Human weaknesses? You know, pain, fear, love. Then as it, audio crackles and pops, some kind of signal loss, their connection seems unstable. Oh, Mark. Another disembodied voice. Oh, Jesus. I love you. Oh, not again. Uh, are you there? Dana, you sound far away. I'm right Dana's here. audio continues to deteriorate. D Dana, I, I, I think I'm losing you. I'm here, Mark. I'm right. Dana's audio cuts out and her spotlight cuts to black. Then, clear as day, a high pitch scream. <coughs> Mark startles. Lights shift. Mark runs in place as a rustic wooden cabin door in a frame is moved into place in front of him. A flashlight sits on a shelf on the upstage side of the frame. Mark grabs the flashlight, flings the door open, flicks the flashlight on, points it straight into the audience and yells. Dana, is that you? Are you out there? Mark steps through the door. Dana? No! Oh. Zombie attack. Lights shift. A flash of red. Mark screams and jolts with, with shock and pain. Ah! Oh. oh, come on. Mark's spotlight cuts to black. Spotlight up on Dana. Still downstage left. She still got the phone pressed to her ear. Her audio is crystal clear again. Mark? Mark, are you there? Dana pulls the phone away from her ear and examines it in her hand. She jogs in place as a, as a home office desk is moved into place in front of her. The home phone base sits on the desk. She reaches around to the back of the desk and pulls the disconnected wire up. The end is sprayed. Oh my God. They've cut the line. Dana's spotlight cuts to black, lights up on Arrow and Finch, wearing loungy t-shirts and shorts, seated on a ratty sofa downstage center, 
they face the audience. They're in a small, dingy, somewhat barren basement room with no windows, lots of wood paneling, and a stand fan droning nearby. There's a small coffee table parked in front of the sofa. On it is an empty VHS case, a half-eaten bag of Twizzlers, and an empty crumpled microwave popcorn bag. An empty backpack leans against the table, and another splays on the floor nearby. Also nearby, a stack of textbooks stuffed with loose papers with a matchbox sitting on top and a desk with landline home phone. For cheap clarity, there might be a wall calendar somewhere in the room, flipped to May with last day circled. Arrow holds a TV remote out. He spots the scene. Well, that guy definitely dies. Yeah, he's super dies. He's <laughs> vindicated. Yeah, not as exciting when you not ready. No, you know this whole thing doesn't even make sense. Yeah, I thought there weren't zombies at the safe house because of the moat. Yeah, man, how could they cut the line from the inside anyway? I don't know. Why would he look for her outside if he knew she was three states away? I don't know. First instinct, I guess. <laughs> What his love instinct? His love weakness. <laughs> Arrow shoves Finch playfully. Finch laughs. He doesn't touch Arrow. Yeah, maybe. I need more popcorn. Arrow gets up and crosses down stage right. He exits into the kitchen. Finch watches him leave. Throughout the following exchange. Arrow can be heard rummaging through cabinets and snapping open the plastic wrapper of a bag of microwave popcorn. Finch briefly surveys his own reflection in the TV screen, tucks out the wrinkles in his clothing, rolls his shoulders back. He wants to look decent, but he's careful not to be caught self-consciously preening on Arrow's return. So he keeps peering over at the door. Also, zombies can imitate human screams now? Yeah, that is not zombie canon. Mm, zombies definitely can do not scream, not even to Lord Dumas side characters. Off stage, the sound of the microwave beeping and wiring and wearing as Aro presses a button on the timer. Worth the three dollars, you think? Hey, don't use the popcorn button. It'll burn. I know. It's my house. And yet, the sound of the microwave stopping, then a few buttons beeping again. The whirring res resumes. Fitch's gaze land on the landline home phone, de uh, phone on the desk. He studies it. It is cheaper than the Cinemart. See? So it's a good thing we were banned. Arrow re-enters, looking skeptical. Throughout the following exchange, the popcorn can be heard popping in the kitchen intermittently at first, then continuously. Nice angle. I thought you guys didn't have cable anymore. No, we don't. Too expensive. Arrow picks up the phone from the base and presses a button. There's no sound. He holds it out to Finch, who lifts it to his ear. We haven't gotten rid of it yet. It's not connected or anything. I think I can hear... The ocean. Oh. Arrow snatches it back, rolling his eyes. He sets it back on the base. Anyway, I'd like to see you find a spin on having to watch everything six months after it releases. Mm. Patience is a virtue. Renters are the last ones to see shit. I know. I hate being late to the party, dude. I keep telling you, we should try disguises. After we tried your two kids in a trench coat idea? Yeah, fat chance. I'm not a good base. I told you, I'm not a good base. Yeah, because you're baby deer legs. Finch grabs the throw pillow from the sofa and whacks Arrow with it. Arrow grabs the pillow and eagerly whacks Finch back. <laughs> Or because you're fucking heavy. Oh, you had us walking like this. Arrow demonstrates a very exaggerated knock knee pigeon toed gait. <laughs> well, you were throwing your weight around like. Finch stands to perform his own exaggerated demonstration, 
wildly wiggling his torso left to right, like a wacky waving inflatable tube guy with one finger raised. One ticket, please. They both performed their demonstrations again. They're laughing now. Arrow braces his hands on Finch's arm. He looks up. Their eyes lock. Their laughter fades. Arrow looks at Finch's mouth. The microwave beeps. I got it. Arrow quickly exits again into the kitchen. Finch doesn't move. Offstage, the sound of Arrow opening the microwave and retrieving the popcorn bag. When do you want to do the bonfire? I'm dying to burn that language arts textbook. Finch gathers himself before replying. I don't know. After we finish the movie? Finch reseats himself on one end of the sofa. He stares at the screen. Sure. My mom said we can stay up as long as we want to celebrate uh, since she's working late anyway. Arrow re-enters with the popcorn bag. He handles it lightly, passing it back and forth between his hands because of the heat. He reseats himself on the opposite end of the sofa and says with a snort. God, so stupid. They've cut the line. Yeah. (laughs) It's also predictable. It's kind of sad. What is? She doesn't even know he's dead yet, and they'll probably kill her, too. Jesus, not this again. Everyone dies at the end. It's just schlock, dude. Who cares? I'm just saying. She would die anyway, right? Based on your logic? Well, what I meant was someday, way in the future, and not from being eaten by zombies. So yeah, that's just a fact of being human. Dana is not a human. She's just writing. Yeah, well. Right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. She's just writing. Dana is just whatever some screenwriter came up with. Arrow picks up the VHS case up and turns it over in his hands demonstrably. Yeah, some screenwriter who's not you, because I don't see your name on this thing. We can come up with a different story. Why? What's the point? Well, the point is they don't have a monopoly on making this shit up. It's called copyright. You are so fucking literal. (laughs) Okay, fine then, Mr. Imagination. Arrow tosses the VHS case back onto the table and throws his hands up. How would you write it? Blackout. End of excerpt. Yay! Am I unmuted? I'm like, my audio is here, but my (laughs) video is there. Hi! Great job! Great job, actors. Take your bows. Take your bows. Fabulous. Keep working on this. Mac, uh, and I can't wait to see where this goes. It's so cool. It's so campy. It's so funny. And also, like, profound and, and cool to think about, like, characters dying in the end. Like, really keep working on this. And all the writers. Can I get all the writers and all of the, uh, you know, the actors? Just everyone come back. And as and as we say goodbye, I just want to thank the writers again for being so brave to share your work. Uh, some of these writers have... Some of the writers is the first time ever hearing their work out loud before. So props and uh, thank you for taking the plunge. Thank you for taking the plunge into this course with us uh, at the Playground Experiment. We welcome you to continue coming back to us. We wanna be your artistic home and you're welcome to come back anytime, not just for this, but for all the different programs that we do at the Playground Experiment. Mike, do you wanna say anything but before we go on that? I do. (laughs) Everybody just unmute yourself quickly and make lots and lots of noise for all of our writers and actors tonight, especially our Woo! Woo! Yeah. 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 We are super excited 
Uh, I'm super excited to announce that you are officially writers. If you weren't before, you are definitely are now. And welcome to the Playground Experiment and welcome all of our new actors to the Playground Experiment. Uh, we're, uh, we do these events. Uh, we are super thankful. Again, huge thank you to David Davila for his eight week course. Uh, be on the lookout for um, a possible next round. So if you are an actor out there or a director and want to write for the first time, be on the lookout when we announce a possible next session summing up at some point. Uh, other things to look out for with the PGE, PGE as was mentioned earlier, um, every second and fourth Monday, we do our volumes, which is where work like this evolves into another 15 minute segment or such. Uh, our next one will be on March, uh, March, not March. Wow. Uh, I've been I've been eating June? Twizzlers, or Twizzlers and popcorn. That's what I've been eating. Um, it will be on June 14th. Um, it, oh, it will be live here on the YouTube. If you're an actor and you want to be considered for casting, you can go to the PGE.com, click on that date, and put yourself in for casting. Uh, our writers are, will send us what they are looking for. Um, and other events we have every Tuesday and Tuesday at noon and uh, Thursday at seven o'clock. If you have an hour that you need to just get something done, it doesn't have to be writing or acting. It could be like knitting or as Al does and knows. It could be anything. If you need to get stuff done. Oh, if you haven't seen Al's knitting, it is brilliant. Amazing. Amazing. Anyway, side note. Um, but you can come <laughs> for one hour. You can come and utilize its accountability. Um, and so, and that we call play dates. Feel free to join us. We have other programs. Um, on Monday, if you are subscribed to this uh, channel, which you should go down below, everybody point, I think it's below. So let's point subscribe. And then of course, don't forget to like the video. But on Monday, if you are subscribed, <laughs> we will be um, posting a video announcing the next three playwrights that are going into development with us, uh, which is what we call our Required Reading First Reads Festival. Uh, we have three plays. Since it's the middle of the summer, we're only doing three. Uh, so if you want to help watch that, be a part of development, uh, or at least find out who those three plays are, uh, subscribe to the channel and you'll get the information or you can subscribe to our mailing list as well. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for coming out tonight. We're super excited. Thank you to David. Um, and uh, again, my name is Mike Lesser, not at the PGE on Venmo, but if for some reason Venmo is your favorite place to send money to, at the PGE is a place you can send. Uh, it helps us <laughs> pay uh, for programs like this and for uh, when we do full readings of plays uh, and uh, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, be on the lookout. Be also be on the lookout for our Faces of America monologue festival. Submissions will be shortly. We have two books on sale on Amazon right now. Two dollars from every book does go to Black Lives Matter. So feel free to look, check that out. Uh, I feel like there's so many advertisements that I'm doing. But that being said, go to our website, thepge.com and find all out that. And I'm going to ask our actors to unmute themselves and say goodbye to everybody on YouTube because they've been sitting here so patiently listening to all this. Bye.